expressed on the following program are not necessarily those of WPSL. However, we do encourage you to like and share them on social media because it's time for the science of caring. Careology. This week, Roxy has a very special guest host, the one and only Milo. Hello, hello, Radio Land. Glad to be here. This is Milo, our beautiful show creator and host. Roxy Brown is out of town this evening, which gives me an awesome opportunity to hang out with Cliff and the rest of the team at WPSL 1590 AM, the talk of the Treasure Coast. This is one of my favorite things to do. It is such a pleasure to be here, everybody. But today we're going to be we're going to be talking a lot about things going on with small businesses as well as issues facing Port St. Lucie. We're going to have a fantastic show tonight, but first for anybody who's joining us for the first time, let's talk about what Careology is. Careology is a radio show that's a wholly owned subsidiary of the 501c3 nonprofit organization Carebag. Carebag's mission is simple. It's to provide access to proper hygiene to those in need for the wellness, uh, wellness of our entire community. Now, rated as a platinum level charity by GuideStar, CareBag is an all volunteer driven organization that fills the gaps not covered by federal assistance by providing feminine products, baby diapers, adult diapers, soap, razors, shampoo, wipes, and other vital hygiene items through their mobile shower units, their mobile hygiene pantry, and their Happy Bottoms project that covers bottoms of all ages. Our show is a weekly radio radio show that shares important information and knowledge with the Treasure Coast about key community services and resources available to them. Now, tonight's guest, we actually have Teresa Aronson, who is the president and CEO of the St. Lucie County excuse me, St. Lucie County Chamber of Commerce, as well as we have two candidates for the city of Port St. Lucie's District 3 City Council seats. We have Jared Michael Greenberg and Greg Blake. But first, Cliff, guess what? We only have 108 days left before our drawing. Are we getting that close already? Yes, December 17th. That's a, just a little over three months. That's a little over three months, and we have a big shout-out that goes to Treasure Coast Lexus in Fort Pierce, who is the sponsor of our drawing, to win a 2021 Lexus UX200. And remember, in this drawing, everything is paid for, including the taxes. Just $25 gets you in the drawing on December 17th. I know Roxy mentions that there are other prizes that they're also giving out prior to December 17th, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that if you win one of the smaller prizes that your name gets taken out of the pot, it stays in the pot for the car, so it's possible to even win more than one prize. So this is amazing. If you're interested, please get out there. Go to www.givecarebag.com. Again, that's givecarebag.com. I know you want a new car. It's $25. You can do this. You can give it to your grandchild, your sister, your friend, your neighbor, your postman. You can do it. You want to help CareBag. It's an amazing organization. Okay, let's get this show rolling here. Again, our first guest tonight is Teresa Aronson. She's the president and CEO of the St. Lucie County Chamber of Commerce, and as president and CEO, she's responsible for the overall operations of the organization. In addition, she volunteers on various boards and committees throughout St. Lucie County to further the mission of the chamber throughout the community. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you, Milo, for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you, thank you. And the timing of this is perfect. Tonight, we're gonna be talking about small businesses, and mm -hmm. we're talking to everyone out there who either owns a small business today or is thinking about starting a, a small business or is somehow affiliated with one. It could be a family member, mm -hmm. even a parent of a small business owner, you name it. And we know that small businesses have been hit hard over the last 18 months. For sure. I mean, definitely everybody can see it throughout the nation. I think we're doing a little bit better here in Florida. We have certainly supported our own and especially here in St. Lucie County. But yes, every business is feeling the COVID crunch. Yes, and we'll get into the details a little more shortly. But just to set the framework, a couple of facts. The SBA defines a small business as less than 500 employees. And right now there are 31.7 billion, that's with a B, small businesses in the United States. Uh, this is a shocking number to me every time I hear it. Small businesses provide work for 47.3% 
of the American workforce. And we know that 20% of small businesses fail in their first year. Uh, we know that close to 44% of small businesses in the United States were temporarily closed because of COVID-19. We have issues of where only 31% of small business owners requested Paycheck Protection Program loan forgiveness. That's only a third that were probably eligible for mm -hmm. that kind of assistance just because they were probably intimidated by the complication of the it's application the process. process. Yes. yes. Right. So, First thing I want to ask you as CEO of the St. Lucie County Chamber of Commerce, can you give us a state of the union concerning small businesses today in St. Lucie County? So I think that in St. Lucie County, we were very fortunate in that um, we were the smallest big city that there ever was. We all know each other. And those locally owned businesses we feel are our own. They're our friends. They're the people that we go to networking breakfast through the chamber with. They're people that we are Facebook friends with. We know these people. And so we were very diligent in our support. I know um, during the shutdown last April, we ran lots of programs and tried to get people out to get takeout from restaurants and continue to kind of support especially those independent small restaurants and i think we did a fairly good job of that but what we saw a lack of was merchandising so a lot of our merchandise retail stores that were not necessarily restaurants um, they didn't fare great everybody learned about this new thing called amazon and they just sort of went to town on that and it was daily deliveries and, and that happens and um and i get it because we were afraid to go out of our houses for a short period of time mm -hmm. but that meant that those businesses that carried those items here locally we weren't putting that money into our tax base and we weren't supporting that business and, and a lot of those were not able to sustain that's something that i think a lot of people forget is that when you're going to some of the bigger retailers online, it's really your neighbors who are suffering the most. We, it's always top of mind, but it's, it's something we need to be reminded of again and again. And we can put it into a monetary uh, you know, valuation, and that is, I always say, Jeff Bezos doesn't live in St. Lucie County, and you gotta follow the trail of money. So that money from Amazon leads back to him. And when you spend it here in St. Lucie County, we estimate that it's distributed again amongst our population up to three times. So every dollar you send to Jeff is one dollar that's not going through three different local hands. Wow, that does, that does paint a very vivid picture. Thank you. And tell me a little bit about the chamber. How many organizations and businesses do you have as part of your... So we're yeah. very fortunate here at the St. Lucie County Chamber of Commerce and St. Lucie County it really in general and this is due to people long before me that had the foresight to know that having one chamber and unifying St. Lucie County would give our chamber more power, more of a voice to represent businesses. So we are very, very fortunate in a rare um, instance we have one unified chamber in St. Lucie County where in many other counties they have one for each city each jurisdiction um, that happens quite a bit we have one here we have some specialty chambers I want to give a shout out to our Haitian chamber because um, they do a great job and so we have some specialty chambers but we're the one unified so we have about 800 members a little less than 800 members now we've had some we've had some loss during this last couple years I would say but um, we are going fairly strong and and we actually partnered with St. Lucie County and some other organizations to try to get the word out to get those PPP loans to, mm -hmm. you know we left a lot of a lot of federal money on the table here in St. Lucie County but we certainly at a chamber tried to do our part by educating we did workshops we did advertisements we did advertisements on tv on facebook trying to make sure that all our small businesses took advantage of every opportunity that there was and there were many and we too at the chamber took advantage of the opportunities that were available to us so that we could maintain ourselves so we could provide further assistance which hopefully we'll get into because i we, when it comes to small business and the resources that we provide i tend to get a little long-winded because I'm passionate about it. But we do have some specialty programs for small businesses that I hope to be able to talk about, but I want to let you get a word No, in. no, that, that sounds, <laughs> that's why you're here. That's why you're here. And um, we know that businesses are at different stages of life. You have brand new businesses, you have some that are kind of in the middle, and then you have others that are mature, perhaps mm -hmm. a family business that's been passed along for a while and they all face different things for example a mature business may find that a new technology 
is coming that is, is really affecting their bottom line. What are some of the services? I know a lot of people understand the value of the chamber when you, they're new and they want to network. Yes. What are some of the services that maybe a mature business that's kind of let its membership lapse? What could you do to help a mature business in that case? So I always like to remind people that yes, we have networking and we have opportunity for you to make the strategic alliances that are going to make a difference in your business, you know, monetarily. But the chamber does more than that. I think that what we are best at is advocacy and education, and that is part of our mission statement. But people don't see that because it doesn't come with, you know, eggs and biscuits on a Tuesday morning. <laughs> so they don't necessarily see the behind the scenes advocacy and regulatory work that we're doing, or even the programs we put into place. For instance, we just signed, an, uh, well, we didn't sign it. I got the contract today. We're getting ready to sign it. Um, a new program with the city of Port St. Lucie, wherein I am going to train a full staff outside of any jurisdiction, the city, the building department, the, the planning department, the zoning department, the licensing department, we are going to train in each department. So when somebody wants to start a business, they can come to us and we can say, okay, this is where you need to start. You need your business tax license. You're also gonna need your liquor license if this which is what you wanna do. If you're a hair cutter, you know you need special plumbing and special traps in order to start to open up your salon. And if you're gonna fry food, if you're a restaurant, you also have to have a special grease try so there's things that people don't know and they go in and they pick out a spot and they get their business license and then they want to open and what they didn't realize was it was an ADA regulated you know spot that they've chosen so mm -hmm. there's got to be structural improvements they may not have all the licensing they need and so we want to we want to sort of guide them through that with our partners at the SBDC and SCORE and all those other people that provide reference or uh, resources as well so they these people may not know it so that's if, great if you're a cosmetologist and you say i'm going to open up my own salon you might be the best hair cutter in town but what do you know about the regulatory process for opening a business right and that's where we come in right and how early can somebody really benefit from your services at the business plan stage or even before that before that so the the biggest problem that we run into is somebody has gotten themselves into a corner that we can't get them out of. So if they've signed a lease and bought the rights and, and you know purchased property, and it's not going to work the way they they thought it was going to. The improvements are too expensive. It's not zoned correctly. So or you don't have a good business plan. You're not able to get your loan that you were planning on getting to open that business. So we want you to come to us before you start planning. So we can help you in the very early stages. Definitely before you sign a lease, before you build a spot, before you purchase property, definitely before then. Come That's to great see to us. know because I think people almost do that last. So once they, they have do a, do it they last, have Milo. Open, <laughs> you have a grand opening, right, Cliff? And then all of a sudden it's, oh, I should probably promote this by joining the chamber. Yeah. Um, but that's where the, the value lies. And let's talk a little bit about the cost. Uh, mm -hmm. If somebody's interested, what are the costs involved with membership? So we have something, we used to do it, you know, kind of uniform, like you have five employees, you pay this, you have 10 employees, you pay this. But what we've done now is we have tailored it to your needs. So let's say you need end, cons end users. You need to get people to come into your shop. So you're going to want to network. You're going to want to come to the breakfast because we have mm -hmm. 100, 125 people at all of our events. So you should probably get the membership that includes your entry to breakfast because that comes with a discount. Okay. If you know you're going to do the Business and Industry Awards, which is a big event that everybody wants to go to every year, 400 people, you might want to do the level that includes your sponsorship to that or includes lunches if you're interested in government. Um, so it depends on what you, what you need to get out of the chamber. We like to tailor it to your needs. It's and not one size And just general at all. ballpark budget, what are, the, yes. what are the ranges? So the smallest membership is $395 per year, and that comes with a website listing and a link, and you, you're in our business guide. You can promote your uh, business at all of our events, all that kind of great stuff. The, and then the highest level gets you a board seat in automatic admission to Leadership St. Lucie, and that's $2,800. So we have many, many, many in between $395 and $2,800. Well, that sounds reasonable compared to my 
my writer union dues. That's boring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, thank you so much. Um, I think we're going to take a break right now. Uh, but thank you, Teresa. What can we do if we need more information? stlucychamber.org, stlucychamber.org. And there's all kinds of information and COVID-related um, information on there as well as resources. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. And we'll be right back with more Careology with Milo. Why call two men in a truck of the Treasure Coast? You want to move your business without moving a single meeting? You want it handled with no fuss. Lots of stuff, no time to move it. You need the pros that care. That's why you call two men in a truck of the Treasure Coast. Family owned and operated franchise. Call 772-236-0827. 772-236-0827. 0827 Movers Who Care. Visit Two Men in a Truck, TreasureCoast.com. How would you like to win a Lexus UX200 with taxes paid? No car payment. That sounds terrific. Go to givecarebag.com. All proceeds go to help our local nonprofit, Carebag Incorporated, where they provide access to proper hygiene to those in our community in need. We also have two additional prizes. Go to givecarebag.com to find out how you could win a beautiful 2021 Lexus UX200. No lease, taxes paid. Drawing December 17, 2021. This is WPSL Port St. Lucie, the talk of the Treasure Coast. You're listening to the science of caring, careology. Roxy's not in tonight, however, she did send a very trusted guest host. And as we're also live on the Facebook as well as WPSL Radio, making an archive for YouTube as well, we have guest number two in the studio now for this edition, part two of tonight's Carology program. And once again, here's your host in Foxy tonight, the one and only Milo. All right, all right. We are back with the Careology Radio Show, The Science of Caring. This is your guest host, Milo. The beautiful Roxy Brown is out today. She's actually out of town, taking a little bit of a well-deserved break with her fabulous husband. So we're going to be talking today about some really great things. But first, if you're just joining us again, this is the care bag careology show and we do have a drawing for a brand new 2021 lexus so be sure to visit www.givecarebag.com again that's givecarebag.com and for 25 dollars, you can win a brand new car it's a drawing not the other thing that starts with an r because we're not allowed to say that word did you know that <laughs> of course well, well, you did. well yeah yeah well it's a, a fundraiser it's a fundraiser. It is a fundraiser. It's a major fundraiser, and yes, uh, somebody somebody could drive home in this vehicle. Yes. Do we think we have Facebook Live back on? It looks like it. It says live. All right. So we're good to go. Look at that. Already solving problems. We have Jared Michael Greenberg, who is a candidate, one of two we have this evening, for the uh, City of Port St. Lucie District 3 City Council seat. How you doing, Jared? Doing good, how you doing? I'm doing great. I love that you are wearing green. Yes, that's, that's my your signature, colors. right? Yes, green and white. That's so, so much fun. Hence with the name Greenberg. Um, yes. So, a little, little pun there. I love it. Just a little bit of background about Port St. Lucie. How long have you been in the area? Let uh, me hear. Moved here in 2008. Okay, so you're going to enjoy this story. I moved down here in 1984 okay. from the New York, New Jersey area. And at the time, Port St. Lucie was so small, we didn't even have a middle school yeah. or a high school. And I was starting middle school, and they had to bus us to Fort Pierce because, again, we only had elementary schools. And the very first week I was here, coming again from the New York area, my classmate, who was 11 years old, was eaten by an alligator. That's he went terrible. swimming. <laughs> he went swimming in Rivergate Park, and he was taken out by a 12-foot alligator. 
And I immediately said, I want to go back up north. <laughs> I was absolutely crazed by it. And this was back in the day when we had alligators that oh, would just be yeah. everywhere when we're driving. But that is not the case now. Port St. Lucie is amazing now. How many residents do we have now? Um, well, I think it's over 197,000, but the census just came out, I think, last week but um, for wow. our official numbers, but I don't know what our official numbers are at the moment, but so it's well over, yeah, I'd say easy. With COVID, with everybody moving into the area, I think we're well over 200,000. I live now in uh, Palm Beach County, so I, have, I only come up here for the joy of hanging out with Roxy and Cliff, that's for sure. But I will say it has changed and oh, there's been some amazing changes with it. So we want to talk to you a little bit about that. So you're running for this council seat. And uh, again, if you could just state your full name and the official office you're running for again. Yep, um, my name is Jared Michael Greenberg. Hello there, everybody on Facebook Live. Um, I'm running for the District 3 City Council seat, which is uh, vacated by Shannon that has um, relieved her position to run for the mayor's spot. Okay. Um, so that's why we have a special election because Greg, the mayor, uh, left to be the um, Island Marotta manager. Um, so when his position became available, Shannon had to relieve her position for the city council, District 3 seat, which left a vacuum. Um, so there's six people running for the special election. Um, so you have a lot of choices right now to, to choose. And uh, of the six, three of them are, e are, are Eagle Scouts, which I think is kind of amazing. I've never heard of that many people that is an Eagle Scout running for a political office at the present time. So it, it's, it's quite a tough race. It is. So, so briefly tell us a little bit more about yourself. Um, well, I'm a Florida native. Grew up in Jupiter Farm, Florida. I rode my horse everywhere. Um, my parents didn't want me to have a dirt bike growing up, so I had a horsepower. Um, so one horsepower and it went everywhere. Um, went to Jerry Thomas Elementary School, all through public schools. Graduated Dwyer High School, which is Palm Beach Gardens. Um, my brother was the first class of Dwyer High School um, that was just finished because we were supposed to go to Jupiter High School. Um, but then I went to University of Florida, graduated with mechanical engineering, go Gators. Um, and then when I uh, lived in Maryland, I uh, pursued my master's and uh, left Maryland um, in 2008 to come back to Florida because Maryland was not Florida. Mm -hmm. I, I like I like uh, my uh, serotonin. Um, Need that sunshine. You gotta have that sunshine <laughs> and uh, work for the power company um, and worked a bunch of different jobs here and there. And uh, so I'm running because I think the ideas I have for the city will make economic prosperity for the city for years to come. Um, and it's all about creating good jobs and having a sustained infrastructure for our residents to keep that them, is what it's all know. about and we're going to get into some of those oh, issues okay. right all now right, right. so first of all let's talk about property taxes for homeowners i know that's a hot button topic that uh property taxes are going up what are some of your plans to either lower or raise the millage and what are people going to get for that well what i want to do is lower the millage rate and so and i think we can do this by two ways um we, I like using things that are currently in our backyard that we're not utilizing to the full potential. And the city of uh, Port St. Lucie in the 50s had two canals built by the Army Corps engineers called the C-23 and C-24 canals. It's 44 miles worth of canals that are fresh water and 220 feet wide, great for boating and fishing and water skiing because that's, that's what I do. Yes, you do jump a few gators here and there if you go <laughs> way out west, but you know. Well, you are a gator. Yeah, that's right, that's right. And uh, so if we, if we make those canals to be ocean access, that allows you to have development 25 miles west of navigable waterways. So that's a huge economic generator for St. Lucie County, for Martin County, and for the city. There's very few people that actually live on these canals in the city of Port St. Lucie. So I'm not doing it for people that live on the canal. You know what I mean? It's, it's future potential because you can have developers that say, hey, I'm going to build 10,000 homes and 30,000 homes, you know, 25 miles from the ocean. And oh, by the way, you can take your boat out. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and so that's one economic idea that I think we should pursue. And you pursue it by, um, I've been doing this for quite a few years, trying, trying to get it to, to come to fruition, is you have to have it uh, federally mandated to do economic feasibility study. So the Army Corps is is told by Congress, federal Congress, not the state of, of Florida, that they need to do an economic feasibility study 
to see what's the, w what is what would cost to do that, and is it worth the the, the price tag to put in two locks um, to have the future economic growth of this area? You know what I mean? Sure. Um, and then the second idea I have is let's use our trash to make money, um, and so. Everybody's garbage has monetary value. Now, currently, we just stick it in the ground and make a mountain out of it, and that's called the Florida Mountains. You know, mm -hmm. so every landfill is a wasted economic opportunity that you can that you can generate money from. So, finding just uh, other sources of revenue for the city, so that we don't really have to be Correct. going Correct. to our homeowners. Because and if you have more revenue coming into the city, that can lower your taxes substantially because you only need so much money to maintain the cities. And that brings us to our next question, traffic. Uh, and I'm asking this question directly for Roxy because <laughs> she tells me traffic is getting pretty nasty out here. So what are some of the issues with uh, our traffic problem? Well, our traffic problem was um, lack of using the engineering recommendations for traffic studies. And so when an engineer puts on a drawing, hey, you should do a roundabout in this area, and then the city says, oh, no, we, we want a, a stoplight, you know, well, there's a, there's a reason why an engineer says you should put in a roundabout in areas because that it decreases the congestion and increases traffic flow. So that's one of the reasons why I moved to the Becker Road area was the, the proposed plan for the Becker Road had three roundabouts on all the major arteries. And I was like, yes, a forward-thinking city. I like it. I want to move here, you know, because um, when I lived in France, we had roundabouts all over the place, you know. And, yes, you learn how to drive through a roundabout. It's, it's very easy. You yield to the people inside the roundabout. Um, and there are no traffic lights. Like, there's no congestion. It, it just makes sense. And so to ease congestion in the city, you're going to have to do change. And... Um, people are very afraid of change. That's why they voted down the roundabouts and said, we want a traffic light. So on 2 o'clock in the morning, you're sitting on a traffic light when you shouldn't be sitting. You should actually be moving if it was a, was a roundabout, you know. And so my plan is everywhere that has a traffic light and when the road gets improved, it's to put in a roundabout. Great. And what are some other ideas you would like to implement if you're elected to this seat? Well, um... I, I want to look at the big picture of the city's problems, you know what I mean, the 30,000 foot level, not the next five year contract for trash, you know what I mean? What is a true economic prosperity look um, with handling services? So if you put in a trash burning recycling plant and you create electricity from your trash versus sticking it and just putting it in the dump, then you can actually make money off the recyclables from that recycled waste that you burn and create electricity from. Mm -hmm. So a simple 100 megawatt unit can generate close to $100 million a year in profit. So instead of putting the $24 million a year in the landfill that you spend for the dump, you ought to actually make that money and make money off of it. So there's three trash burner power plants in South Florida, one down in Fort Lauderdale and two in Palm Beach County. Um, and unit two just came online in 2015, which is a brand new unit first plant ever built in 15 years in the United States that's a trash burning power plant you know and people are, oh it's going to have emissions it's going to be terrible for, for the environment it's just the opposite because these are modern plants with modern technologies you can't have particulates in your exhaust from your power plant because EPA will shut them down yes you know what I mean so they're cl it's clean I say clean but it's derived from trash you know what I mean it's kind of an oxymoron but it is a energy source that isn't being really utilized where the rest of the world is doing it. Like the United States is, when you look at the, and if you go to my website, it's all on there, little PowerPoint presentations, is like the last industrialized country that actually converts waste to energy, you know? And Sweden, their waste energy power plants, they have 1% that go to the landfill. 1% of 1%, your trash. 1%, that is you know, amazing. That's insane, you know what I mean? There's a lot we can learn from other countries, yeah, I absolutely. think, that we often close our eyes, but as somebody's lived overseas, yeah. you can definitely attest to that. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit, CareBag originally started off as a charity servicing the homeless population. Mm -hmm. it is, it's, it's expanded its services into hygiene for all individuals who need it, where, again, just really filling the gaps where federal assistance doesn't cover things like diapers or feminine products. And with the mobile showers, the mobile pantry units, uh, the hygiene product pantry units, um, 
I wanted to ask you, the one thing that always gets me is that this area still does not have a homeless shelter. Mm -hmm. And yet there, at last count, there was almost 2,000 homeless individuals. And with COVID, I don't, actually, if I were homeless living up north, I don't know why I wouldn't take a bus and come down to this beautiful area. Because uh, some of the homeless camps, quite frankly, are some of the most beautiful areas of our state to be I've been out there with Roxy and Carebag doing volunteer work. What do you think about, um, how would you feel if somebody had presented to you about putting a homeless shelter somewhere in Port St. Lucie? Well, I totally support it because just because you're um, down on your luck doesn't mean you're a bad person. You know what I mean? And a lot of people that uh, take California, for example, moved to California, they had dreams and aspirations. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, they lost their job. And California right. had one of the highest homeless population in the United States. Now, I do not want Florida to be California by any stretch of the imagination. Definitely, you know I mean? right. Um, but you have to take care of people when they're down in the luck. And these yes. are very intelligent, capable human beings. They are good that, people. That can do work. You right. Know I mean? and, Many uh, of them are working. Yeah. Uh, one of the most shocking statistics, and this was this is a couple of years old, but about three years ago, Carebag found out that 40% of the homeless population they were working with actually had jobs. Yeah. So it's not about people who are unemployed. It's um, finding them an affordable place to, to yes. live that's safe. So they can they can get back on their on, on their feet and getting you know? businesses attracting businesses yes. that are providing living wages yes. at all different skill levels and, and that's I why you should vote for Jerry Greenberg because you need to have an economy based on thirty five dollars an hour not Amazon fifteen dollars an hour right you know what I mean you can't raise a family a great Amazon is here uh, that's wonderful but you can't raise a family on fifteen dollars an hour it's very difficult to afford a two hundred thousand dollar home with a $15 an hour salary. I mean, yes. it's just, it just physically it is impossible. We have about three minutes left, and what I'd love for you to do is I want you to describe how you see Port St. Lucie in 20 years if you're elected. Port St. Lucie in 20 years? Well, hopefully we will have sidewalks everywhere, and especially around every school because schools within two miles of it um, aren't bust. So I want the kids to be able to walk to their schools safely without having to be hit or run over by cars. Um, as soon as possible. You know what I mean? I think that is, I have two young girls, they're not in school yet, but I would love for them to be able to walk or ride their bike to school because that helps physical exercise for our children and definitely bring PE back to schools, bring the trades classes back to high schools. So when you graduate, um, you can have a trade or a skill that you can actually support a family on. And you, not college isn't for everybody. I was fortunate that I was able to go to college, but there's a ton of people that I know that aren't college educated that make way more money than I do that are skilled laborers. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. So I'm supporting hands-on learning, um, welding, plumbing, HVAC, you name it. You graduate high school, you should be able to go take your test and be a licensed contractor and, and start your small business. And with IRSE doing small business programs, that they'll learn, hey, this is how you financially manage a business to be successful. That's right. You know? Low to no student debt can get you to a seven-figure net worth faster yes. than somebody who has spent time and too much money getting a four-year degree. That is Absolutely. so true. We don't tell our kids that enough. Um, this has been really great. Jared Michael Greenberg, who is wearing his signature green for his campaign, most important question, when is the election? It's a special election, so when do we go vote? Yeah, so you can go vote now. It's early voting is is um, already already mailed in my ballot. Um, voted for myself, of course, you know. Um, <laughs> but it's September 21st is the election day. Okay. And um, then more likely it's going to be a runoff election because there's six candidates. There's no way statistically you're going to have 51% of the vote, you know. Sure. Um, and then December, I think, 7th is the when the runoff election is going to be. And then, um, then the real election is in 2022 for the next four-year term. Um, so people are going to be hearing campaigning about District 3 City Council for about a year and a half. So we you, want, you want people to vote for you three times. Exactly. September times. 21st, December, December 7th, 7th. And then in 2022. And I don't have those dates yet. 2022. That sounds good. And are all voting locations open, or you're just talking about get your mail-in ballot and make it happen? Yeah, make um, the polling places will be open for normal voting on the 21st, okay. according to supervisor of a elections. Um, but early voting location is drop-off. It's only at four locations this year. Um, 
and that information is on their website or you can go to my website and click on the supervisor elections website and it'll go right to it um, and you can get your absentee ballot from my website because it's a link to their website for the PDF form. I'm all about getting people's information out as much and as possible. And throw out that website one more time. So we go. my website is, uh, I'll hold it up on Google, on <laughs> the, the, the live thing, but I'll actually say <laughs> it is sites.google.com backslash view backslash vote for Jared Michael Greenberg. That is and the longest URL yeah. I have ever heard in political yeah. history. Can we do a Google search and find you? Yes. Can we just do, put your name in quotes, yep. Jared Michael my, Greenberg? And you'll be able to get that's to my the way YouTube to do it. channel and um, the website as well. All right, that sounds great. Thank you so, Thank much, you for so much for being here. And that's Jared Michael Greenberg, who is a candidate for the city of Port St. Lucie District 3 city council seat. We're gonna take a little break and we'll be right back. If you could reimagine the way you buy a car, what would you do? Make it simple, make negotiations disappear, demand transparency, then experience amazing at your Treasure Coast Lexus dealer. Car buying simplified. Treasure Coast Lexus is a proud sponsor of Carology. Every Tuesday at 6.05 p.m., caring and supporting for our community. Car buying simplified. Check out your Treasure Coast Lexus dealer. How would you like to win a Lexus UX200 with taxes paid, no car payment? That sounds terrific. Go to givecarebag.com. All proceeds go to help our local nonprofit, Carebag Incorporated, where they provide access to proper hygiene to those in our community in need. We also have two additional prizes. Go to givecarebag.com to find out how you could win a beautiful 2021 Lexus UX200. No lease, taxes paid. Drawing December 17, 2021. This is WPSL Port St. Lucie, the talk of the Treasure Coast. Welcome back to Carology, the science of caring. And once again, here's your host, Milo. Hello, hello. Welcome back to Carology. We have a very special guest. We have Greg Blake, who is a candidate for the city of Port St. Lucie District 3 City Council seat, who's going to answer my incredibly tough questions about Port St. Lucie. I'm joking. I'm not going to be that hard. Um, how are you doing, Greg? Great, great. How are you? You want to get a little closer to the microphone yeah, sure. so we can definitely, everybody can hear you. So we had another candidate who is also running for the same seat. And I know there's much love out there. You guys all get along. Um, we're going to just, I'm going to ask some of the same questions. And just for the record, for those of you who are joining us, if you could state your full name and the office that you're running for. Okay. Yeah. My name is Gregory Blake, and I'm running for Port St. Lucie. Uh, City Council District 3 seat. Okay, and when is this election taking place? Uh, so the early voting is going to start on September 11th through September 18th, and a lot of people should have gotten their sample ballot so they can see where they can do some of the early voting. And uh, the actual election will be on September 21st, and then um, a possible runoff on uh, December 7th. Okay, so September 21st, December 7th, and uh, we mentioned that with our last guest. So. I do understand that city council does not have political parties. Uh, so how would you describe yourself? Would you consider yourself more of a traditional moderate candidate or do you consider yourself more of a forward thinking public servant? I would, I would say it's probably more on like uh, the conservative side. My beliefs are more towards um, uh, smaller local governments, um, taxes, you know, uh, rather on the lower side. Oh, sorry. Um, Lower taxes and um, you know like a free a free economy in the area, a free market economy where we're not the government's not really getting involved um, uh, per se in a lot of the affairs of the businesses. Um, okay. So that's kind of where uh, I'd say where I sit, almost middle of the road. Beautiful. And just briefly, if you can tell us a little bit about yourself, how long have you been in the area? I've lived in the area close to 20 years. I'm originally um, a New Englander, uh, so I probably just lost a majority of the people. Uh, that listen to you because they're all probably Not Dolphins all. fans. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> um, but I, I've been here for quite a while. Um, like I said, originally from uh, from New England, but now I live in um, in uh, Southern uh, PSL, like in the three four nine five three zip code area, and I love it there. Great community. And what inspired you to run for office? Um, so I, I think it's just uh, I, I think we just need a change. 
um, maybe a different outlook, some fresh ideas. Um, I think there's uh, some people um, that are out there that, that would like to see that. And also, uh, I think a lot of people heard me heard me complaining about taxes, and they're like, okay, well, why don't you go do something about it? And um, I'm like, you know what? I think that's, uh, I think that's a good idea, and, and that's what's uh, led me here. I'm sure you have a couple of ideas about really handling the taxes and, and possibly lowering the millage. What are just what are what's one of those many ideas you have for helping out homeowners? So definitely I think that's the main the main problem with a lot of the issues that we have in Port St. Lucie. I think they can all be traced back um, to taxes, property taxes and how high they are. And um, I think one way we can look at a lot of different economic models and a lot of them are very old, like hundreds and hundreds of years old and uh, essentially, they all say the same thing, that if we, if we lower the taxes, um, then there's more to be pumped into the, into the economy. It's not a one-to-one offset, but what happens is, is we get um, higher wages because there's more competition. Uh, companies need more jobs, and I think the one thing I'll do is kind of like move us more towards a, uh, a more of a moderate tax base. Um, or moderate taxes so that we have more money freed up so people can go buy a burger you know from their local restaurant they have extra money and then now that burger joint can go ahead and hire another you know another waitress and I think that's really where uh, you know where we need to go with um, right now it's uh, you know a lot of people you know 20 30 bucks extra a month would be huge for them yes and I, and I think we need to remember that um, you know last census I think nine percent of our city was in poverty and that's going to surprise a lot of people, but there's a lot of people that are barely hanging on, and you know they've been through a lot. You know, a lot of them were here during the last housing crisis. They're still here, and you know I think we start looking out for them. Yes, and as a matter of fact, um, one of the things that we talked about earlier, and I wanted to ask you, is that there's a shortage of skilled workers in the area, and also we're looking at possibly attracting more businesses that will offer well-paying jobs, living wages, not just a minimum wage or minimum wage plus one. What are some of the ideas that you have to bring businesses here? Well, I think that that's a huge problem. We have a weird dichotomy of jobs um, in our area, and one is that a lot of the higher paying jobs aren't here. And then the lower paying jobs that we have, well, you know, we know we, we have the, we're the worst in the area for jobs to population ratio. So what these what the job market's going to do, what all the businesses are going to do, they're going to find that equilibrium. And what that is is lower wages because mm-hmm. of just that supply and demand. And I think if we lower once again, once again, not to you know beat a dead horse, but if we lower taxes, we're going to have more businesses that can strive here. We've seen a lot of failed businesses, and they're not all from the same um, field, from the same spectrum of uh, of work. And we've seen them all fail. And you know, if we can have more of them available, more jobs, they prosper. You know, instead of being in spite of the city, you know, they prosper. And what that's going to happen is, you know, there's going to be more jobs available. And then we're going to start to get to where that equilibrium of salary is going to go up. Um, I don't think we should champion, you know, unfortunately living in this community, championing middle, um, you know, minimum wage jobs. It's going to be very difficult um, to live here, especially with uh, the, the high property taxes that we do pay, which is the, literally the highest in the state. Shocking. It wasn't like that just a decade ago, Cliff. Not at all. So, yeah, that's something, and again, just a little bit about me. I moved down to Port St. Lucie when I was 13. My parents retired, and then as soon as I could, I was out of here, and I came back. (laughs) I'm now in Palm Beach County, but I went back up north, and I'm here. But Port St. Lucie is where I spent my high school years, and it is my second hometown. And when we were here in 1984, it's 32,000 residents, and everything changed with Hurricane Andrew. For those of you who just joined the area, came here just recently, um, Hurricane Andrew changed the dynamics and the demographics because so many people lost their homes and they all moved up here at one time, it felt like. And we had just an enormous amount of growth. And I'm feeling like somehow that growth is still almost uncontrolled. What made Port St. Lucie so attractive 10 years ago were the housing prices, the low property taxes, the bang for the buck, the safety, which is, we cannot forget how wonderful Port St. Lucie does as far as the crime statistics. It's always been that way. Um, What are some of the things that you would like to see improvements made on traffic and other areas that are affected by increased in growth? 
I think there's two ways that we can address that. Um, one of them is we still have, uh, the majority of the city's already developed. Um, so but we, do, we do still have some areas that are, are gonna be developed. I think we need to, when we develop them, uh, think of like walkability in mind, like make it so that, hey, people can live at their home and within a 15 mile walking radius, they, or 15 minute um, walking radius, they can get, you know, like Publix or, you know, let's say they wanna go to Target. You know, I think that's important. Um, there's definitely a lot of studies to show that it, it makes it easier for the city as far as like maintenance, uh, less of a cost on the infrastructure, lowers crime, and it, it increases um, uh, property values. And then even there's like the health benefit of it. You know, the American Heart Association wrote a nice article about it and how they noticed that people that live in cities that have a wa high walkability are uh, a lot more healthier. Um, so that's definitely one aspect what we need to do. We need to plan for the areas that are already developed by the by GDC those many years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we can have some public transportation to bring people to these areas where they can do all their shopping and then take public transportation back to their home. But um, you know, another aspect is is we need to start having um, a higher amount of, of impact fees. And I know a lot of you know, like a, a lot of the development companies probably aren't excited, you know, about that. But um, that that would end up getting passed on to, unfortunately, like the consumers, the new homeowners. But I mean, if we look at it this way, instead of taking out bonds and taxes to pay, you know, for these new roads that we have to do, the new infrastructure for, let's say, water, um, you know we pay it up front, you know, it's paid up through these funds. It's like, you know, if you go buy a brand new truck and and you want running boards on it, like, yeah, okay, well, you're financing those running boards on there. It's going to cost you more. Whereas if you take that truck home, go to Amazon and order some, you know, that's it. You paid for it. That's it. It's not through the financing where it becomes more expensive. So I think those are definitely some th ways we need to look at to reduce it. Because in the end, we're going to have to expand these roads. These main arteries yes. need to be expanded. Crosstown is great. They developed that with you know a couple of years in advance, you know foresight. So that's outstanding. But we still need to do that in PSL and a lot of other the, the major thoroughfares. Mm -hmm. And um, I asked our last guest also. Carebag originally served the homeless population almost exclusively and has expanded its, its service to anyone who's in need of hygiene products. Um, and I was working with the organization as a volunteer very early on. I wanted to ask you, again, one of the things that just gets me is that we do not have in this area on the Treasure Coast a, a bona fide homeless shelter that is not attached to a religious organization. There are some homeless shelter uh, areas, but you have to be part of a religious sermon and such to receive their services. And I think that's fantastic. And I think it's great for the community. But I'm talking about something that is purely supported by our government and our local people. What do you think about having a homeless shelter somewhere in Port St. Lucie? Would you support that? Yeah, I would support that. Um, I, I think it's, you know, I think I think it's a lot of a lot of people can get behind that. Um, like we do, a, a, we do have a homeless like population here that a lot of people aren't aware of. Um, you know, I think it's definitely a need for the community. Like I, I work next to when I work at Cleveland Clinic Martin South. Um, I work in the ED there uh, on occasion. Hi everyone, I love you guys. Um, not too far from there, there's a La Haya. Um, it's uh, love and hope and action. And what they do is they provide a lot of services and that they don't just put a band aid on it. You know, they try and help people. You know, get back on their feet. Yes, that's what that's what we need. A, a band aid isn't gonna isn't gonna like fix the problem. You know, a, a lot of these people need uh, need attention, um, and I think as a community, I, I definitely think that's something we should do. It we benefits need to help us each all. Other. It, it would be a support it pays, center. It pays dividends. Uh, you know, down the road, definitely by doing that to look out for you know each other. Um, so yeah, I hundred percent support that. That sounds great. And um, if you're elected. How would you describe Port St. Lucie in 20 years from now? What would it look like? Wow. So, well, if elected, I'd love to see. Hopefully, I'm not there, too, um, because I don't want to do this permanently. I want to go in and try and make the changes I can and then go back to what I, you know, what I do. Um, so hopefully someone smarter takes over after me, too, if I get elected. Um, but I, I think what it has to be, it has to be a, a, a community where, you know, we have continuity of our neighbors. You know, er everyone's here, they're staying here. Um, they work here, they live here. Um, that's kind of what we're missing. And I, I think we're trying, 
in different ways to get that you know the city center is going to be our downtown and Mm -hmm. like i think the best way to get that is just by bringing people back home like bringing them here to where they work here and you know they work here they play here they live here and that's what we need and and i hope you know that we can get there um because that i think that's what everyone looks for when they look for a nice community to live in absolutely and are there any other programs or ideas that you would like to implement if you're elected so uh, definitely a, a big one that I, that I would love to um, implement is I, I definitely think we're, we're short on teachers, we're short on uh, first responders, and we're short on, uh, on nurses. Um, I, I think an incentive for them, bring them back, um, bring them into the community. A lot of them work down, if you drive on I-95 or the Turnpike, you see their vehicles all the time. And that's rep- that represents a lot of the people that are commuting out of here. And we need to bring these people back into our community um, I think a lot of the problems we have could be solved uh, from that, you know, like having these law enforcement, having a discount on them uh, for their taxes. And if we look at retention wise, instead of training them and then them going down to, you know, Palm Beach County or even Martin County, if we train them here, we keep them here, we keep them in the community, that Mm -hmm. retention, the bonus of it is that we're not going to have to train another officer $100,000, you know, to stay here. Right. And if somebody wants to learn more about you and what you stand for, where can they go on the Internet? Uh, definitely. You can go to uh, votegregblake.com and, um, you know, there's there's information on me there. There's links to my Facebook page, too. Great. Votegregblake.com. Greg, thank you so much. We've got Greg Blake again, City of Port St. Lucie, District 3 City Council seat candidate. Thank you for being thank on you. the show. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right. We've got a couple of minutes left. You know, first I wanted to say something, Cliff, and I know Roxy would kill me if, if we did the show without saying this. Oh my. Our thoughts and prayers, of course, are out to with all of the people of Louisiana who have faced oh everything with Hurricane Ida as somebody. I've been in 11 hurricanes. How many hurricanes have you been through? Cliff? Oh, my. I, it started, though, with uh, my first one, Hurricane David, back in 79. And every one of them since that's, that's hit this area. I have been in pretty close to this area. Hurricane Andrew, not too far from that one, and also Sandy up in New York. Because I left Florida and went to New York to get away from the hurricanes. They followed me. I came back down. But we do know that the folks in Hurricane Ida, what they're going through, and it means a lot. And I also wanted to give our thoughts and prayers to the 13 servicemen and women who lost their lives in Afghanistan. My husband is an Afghan war veteran. And... Um, Um, I know what it's like to be a family member of a service person, and it is something else um, that we've really lost those 13 beautiful souls. But America loves you to everyone, all of our vets, all of our service people, um, the Careology Show, the Science of Caring, Care Bag. We serve a lot of veterans who are in need on the Treasure Coast area, so we wanted to make sure we made that that, uh, I was surprised when I started meeting some of the homeless people in Fort Pierce caught him standing at an ATM with his pension card. Yes. And I thought, I thought homeless people were, were broke all the time. That's not necessarily so. Not in our area. Again, again, this was three years ago, 40% held full-time jobs. So if they were bad people, they'd be in jail. Remember that. There are neighbors without walls. But thank you, everyone, for listening. This is Milo, your guest host. Roxy will be back next week on Carology, the science of caring. Archives of the show are on YouTube. Go to WPSLTV.com and look for Carology. Presented by CareBag. Tuesday evenings in the 6 o'clock hour, right here. Digital 1590 WPSL is one of the many reasons that we're the talk of the treasure coast.